Good afternoon and welcome to Facebook Live with Holy Cross Health. My name is Brenton Andrasik, Manager of Physician Alignment and Business Development at Holy Cross. Before we begin, I'd like to call your attention to a few ground rules that you'll see in the comments section. We encourage you to participate, but please keep any questions and comments general. We won't be discussing anyone's specific health situation in this public forum. If we can't get to every question today, we'll provide additional feedback through our website, or we'll connect with you through one of our program channels by a phone or by website. For those of you joining us today on Facebook, we thank you for being here and for taking an active role in your health, and we at Holy Cross are happy to be your partner in your health journey. We're here today to talk about clinical trials and research in cancer care and the opportunities that exist here at Holy Cross Health. Clinical trials help broaden access to cancer care, offering patients access to innovative and groundbreaking options for prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. But this progress could not happen without the people who choose to participate in and those who connect people with trials. Today's discussion will provide information about clinical trials and research so that you and your loved ones can make an informed decision about participating. Today we're here with Dr. James Barger, gynecologic oncology surgeon and medical director of gynecologic oncology research at Holy Cross Health, and Dr. Pablo Gutman, chairman of the anatomic pathology department and medical director of the Cancer Institute at Holy Cross Health. Dr. Barter is a renowned surgeon who utilizes the latest minimally invasive technology and techniques to screen, diagnose, and treat benign and malignant tumors affecting women's reproductive system. As principal investigator and as a medical director of oncology research at Holy Cross, Dr. Barter's contributions continue to improve treatment options for ovarian and cervical cancer patients. Dr. Gutman is an expert in researching, studying, and diagnosing diseases by analyzing sample tissues fluids, and cells at a microscopic level. As the chairman of Holy Cross Health's Institutional Review Board, Dr. Gutman and a team comprised of highly qualified members served as an important role in protecting and managing risk to human participants involved in clinical trials and research. So to start off, Dr. Gutman, can you tell us broadly what is a clinical trial and how does that differ from what we might call basic or bench research? Good question. So uh, a clinical trial uh, really is 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 in a way the question and the answer to uh, what we see in medicine today. That is, no, uh, uh, there is nothing we do in medicine nowadays that in one form or another has not been uh, um, uh, associated with a clinical trial. Uh, 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 we need answers to certain questions. Those answers come uh, both through base, what we call basic research and what we call clinical research. And, and uh, you asked the distinction between those two uh, types of research. One, uh, basic research is conducted in, mostly in the laboratory uh, on cells or tissues or animals or molecules. Uh, clinical research, which is the type of research that we do here at Holy Cross, uh, um, really is, is uh, research on human subjects, on patients. Uh, so there's a, quite a distinction between the two, uh, uh, and hospitals such as ours, large community hospitals that have a lot of experience with cancer, are actually uh, at the front line of what we call clinical research nowadays. And you touched on this a little bit, but I was hoping maybe you could just talk a little bit more about why is clinical research so important? Why is the work that we do here so crucial to developing well, again, we, we really would not be able to treat patients for the kind of complicated cancer cases that we see if there had not been research, investigation, questions answered uh, before we get to the point of treatment. That is, any type of surgical approach, any type of medication, uh, any kind of therapeutic agent that is used on a patient had to undergo uh, questions and answers, which is essentially what research is about. We, we can't just decide one day to say, well, we believe this molecule may cure cancer, correct? There has to be investigation. There has to be a systematic scientific approach to answering the question whether a certain compound or molecule is effective in treating cancer. And, and Dr. Goodman, we know there are different types of, uh, of clinical trials. Could you tell us about some of the categories and, and different types of trials that are available? So, uh, you know, clinical trials uh, sometimes are categorized into what is called phase one through four uh, trials. And, and those have to really do, have to do with the stage uh, at which a, a clinical trial is. 
Uh, for example, to give you an extreme uh, a clinical uh, a phase one clinical trial is when that molecule or that compound or that drug has just left the laboratory. And, and what we're really interested in are very basic questions, not whether it will cure or whether it will treat a, a, a certain cancer, but the basic questions may have to do with, is it safe? Uh, what kind of uh, preliminary dose can we use on a patient? So, so really that is the, the early, fa phase one is the very early stage of, of, of uh, cancer. Uh, moving along in those uh, stages or phases of clinical trials, moving through two, three, and four, uh, we get more specific answers and we look at uh, whether a drug is effective, whether it cures, whether it, it uh, 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 slows the progress of the disease. Uh, and so at that point, uh, we're dealing with much larger populations of patients and much more specific questions as to whether a drug is effective or not in treating a certain disease. Thank you for that, that explainer. Uh, Dr. Barter, I'd like to turn to you. Uh, who conducts clinical trials and where do those trials typically take place? To conduct a, a trial, it's a huge effort and it's, it's, it takes a huge team. Because it really does. Everybody has a role in the trials and everybody needs to, to add to the trial to make sure that it's safe, first of all, and secondly, to make sure that the outcome can be reliably relied upon as far as statistical analysis. It's important that the patients uh, understand on, on that level what what the uh, advantages are of being in a trial, and what the safeguards are. And I think that's the, the major thing that we see here, is that we'll, we'll get carried away with introducing a trial, and we'll, uh, we'll forget to go back and add an informed consent element. Uh, and that's where Dr. Gutman, being the head of the, the research effort, uh, and his staff will, will fit in. Yeah, and we'll certainly be... Uh addressing the Institutional Review Board and, and all of those uh, risk management efforts as well um, as we go along here. So, uh, Dr. Barter, who can participate in a trial? Um, you know, what sort of patients might benefit? And uh, you know, why would someone be interested in taking part? I would like to think that um, it would be to advance the understanding of a disease and also to help try to cure that disease. That's, that's basically the main effort in, in my mind. Now, there are a bunch of different studies and trials that, that we conduct uh, here as a surgeon. Uh, many of them have to do with um, making surgery safer as well. So thinking about some of the specific things that are available here. So Dr. Gutman, could you tell us a little bit about some of the clinical trials and some of the research that's being done here at Holy Cross? Sure. So, so uh, we try to adapt our trials and decide on the type of trials that uh, we will have based on what types of diseases we see. And, and Holy Cross, uh, because of uh, surgeons like Dr. Barter and others, uh, is, is uh, really number one uh, uh, in the area, in the area of GYN surgical oncology. So we see uh, quite a lot of uh, fallopian tube, ovarian, uterine cervical cancer. So we have a number of trials uh, suited for those type of diseases. Uh, and, 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 and not only is the, idea, is the idea of the research behind this, but we have to understand that a lot of these patients uh, are left without options. That is that they have exhausted sometimes all standards of care uh, and, and are looking for other possibilities. And, 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 and research and clinical trials offer those possibilities that may not be available in other institutions uh, that do not see the volume of uh, gynecological surgical oncology that we have here. Uh, other type of trials that we uh, have are breast uh, cancer. We uh, have a very active uh, breast surgeon, Dr. Uh, Eric Oristian, uh, who runs a number of trials. Uh, we also are uh, specialized in thoracic surgery, so we see a lot of lung cancer at our institution. Uh, Dr. Steinberg, Dr. Karras are, are uh, surgeons that uh, run a number of thoracic and, and, and lung cancer trials. So, so we really try to tailor our research towards the types of cancers that we see uh, quite frequently in our population in our in our hospital. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned some of those those key services that we do focus on and that we uh, you know do offer real academic level 
quality care uh, close to people's homes in the community. Uh, you know, Dr. Barter, Dr. Goodman mentioned uh, quite a bit about gynecologic oncology research. Could you tell us some of the specific projects that you've been involved in at Holy Cross over the years? Yes, we've had the GYN portion opened at least since 2006, and we've put about 1,300 patients on various trials. And the trials can be relatively straightforward, or they can be very complicated and rely a lot on a lot of the bench work that has gone into the lab uh, before we we assume that that the uh, the a new drug is is going to to work. We need to make sure that it's safe, it's efficacious, it's well tolerated. So that's sort of the the thrust of it. And as a we have another area that we do studies in. We've had we have uh, now three different studies that we've participated in where we're trying to find a blood marker so that ideally we can screen for a cancer. And I think those are those are very, to me, very intriguing, very interesting. Something something that can help more universally than say just a, a drug that we might. Uh, try to see if it's efficacious for ovarian endometrial or cervical cancer. Yeah, I think that's a really uh, interesting point. I do to point out that this research is occurring across the continuum of care. It's not just treatment, um, that it's also about uh, moving upstream and looking at better ways to be able to screen for and diagnose uh, cancer and, and other issues in patients. Um, in this conversation, uh, we were talking with Dr. Barter about one of his studies where uh, actually he's, he, they're trying to investigate the possibility of detecting ovarian cancer very early on, because as we know, uh, many cases of ovarian cancer, once they're diagnosed, uh, are advanced. So the, that possibility of early detection of ovarian cancer is extremely important. And, and Dr. Barter has had this protocol open here at Holy Cross now for, for some time. <clears throat> so uh, to that end, Dr. Goodman, could you tell us a little bit about how patients typically might get involved in participating in a clinical trial here? So, so there's, there's different ways in which patients uh, uh, participate in clinical trials. I, I'd say that the two most common ways are, uh, one is that a patient is under treatment and their medical oncologist or their surgeon or their radiation therapist uh, will offer them the possibility of participating in a trial. Uh, this is both, again to, again, to advance research, to advance knowledge, but also because a patient, again, if, there are, if they have advanced disease and they've undergone a number of different treatments, may be left without standard of care options, and therefore research is one other possibility of continuing their treatment. The other common way that we see patients approaching clinical trials, and this is especially true in, in our population, in our area, we, we, we are dealing really with quite an educated community uh, that is very much aware of all the different possibilities uh, we live around several academic centers. There's many large community hospitals in our area. Uh, and, and so pa patients will go to Google and, and they, will, they will research their diseases. Uh, this is very different than what was happening 20 or 30 years ago, uh, where patients really did not know what was happening to them. By the time they, they reach us, uh, they have done a lot of their own research. Uh, um, many times they will go to several consultations, so they will have seen many different physicians before they decide uh, to be treated. So, so I would say those are the two main ways, you know, the internet approach uh, and, and the second way uh, is, is the, the recommendation of a clinician or the suggestion of a clinician or a surgeon that says uh, maybe we're at that phase where a clinical trial would be used. Dr. Goodman, you mentioned uh, working collaboratively with patients um, to, to integrate uh, trials into their, their treatment plan um, and, you know, working with people that have a lot of uh, knowledge coming into the process um, and working together to make a treatment plan that's individualized and that's, that's tailored to the patient. Um, Dr. Barter, could you just tell us a little bit more about how uh, the team takes research uh, opportunities into consideration when trying to formulate a treatment plan in conjunction with the patient? I think the, the hardest thing about conducting these studies is that we need to get doctors and patients better informed that there are studies that are available and that we are obviously taking every safeguard that we can 
to protect the patient, but also we, we want to try different approaches, uh, especially in many of these cancers where the, the progress really hasn't been that great over the last, in some instances, 40 years. And so we're always trying to find a new approach to curing cancer. So, Dr. Gutman, when a patient enrolls in a trial at Holy Cross, they're really part of an entire research program and apparatus. Could you tell us a bit about the research program and the team of people that really make it run? So this is uh, truly what we call multidisciplinary. That is, that is the, there's not just physicians, surgeons, clinicians involved in this. Uh, there's a whole team of nurses behind this, uh, uh, pharmacists, social workers, uh, physical therapists. This is, uh, uh, there are at least, I would say, 10 to 15 different specialties that somehow touch uh, a patient that will participate in a, in a, in a, clin in a, in a clinical trial. Um, uh, overseeing all this um, is what we call the Institutional Review Board. Uh, Holy Cross uh, has an Institutional uh, Review Board here uh, and has had it for many, many years. Um, uh, this is a, a, a group of people uh, that uh, sit down for several hours a month uh, and discuss what we call the benefit ratio of a clinical trial. That is, a surgeon like Dr. Barter will come to us and say, I'm interested in, in this clinical trial that I would like to propose to uh, the Holy Cross community. So what we do is we sit down and, say, and ask ourselves, well, what exactly would be the benefits of this trial? So the benefits may be understanding better ovarian cancer, understanding how to diagnose it early, understanding how to treat it uh, uh, at an early phase or in a more efficient way. But the other part of the equation is not just the benefit, but, but the risk. That is, uh, we, we were very careful uh, evaluating uh, um, what the risk, what the, let's call it, danger uh, to the patient is of participating in a trial. Because there is always a certain risk. Uh, these may be medications uh, that are, have not been used as much as other standard of care medications, uh, there may be less experience with them. They may, may be more toxic, or at least we may, there may be aspects of their toxicity that we're not aware of. Uh, so, so we're constantly ev evaluating this ratio and saying, yes, this sounds reasonable. For this possible benefit, we are willing to offer. No one is, by the way, no one is mandating a patient a, a, a participant in a trial, but we're willing to offer. We think that it's reasonable to offer to our patient population uh, this clinical trial. If we see that the benefits may be minor, but the risk is very high, the risk of toxicity, complications, etc., that institutional review board may decide that that is not a trial uh, for our patient population and for our system. So, so those would be the main components. That is the professional team and the multiple specialties. Uh, that will actually uh, run the trial in this uh, uh, review board, this institutional review board that is looking over everything uh, constantly and making sure uh, that there are safety mechanisms in place and that there is a good ratio of uh, uh, this risk benefit that I just described. I think that that's a very helpful overview and, and hopefully gives people a lot of insight into all of the protections that are built into the research program here and the really tremendous amount of thought that goes into um, helping to balance that risk-benefit uh, ratio for our patients. Um, Dr. Goodman, following up on that, um, how do participants withdraw from a study? First of all, can they? And then how um, can they withdraw from a study if they decide, you know what, it's not for me anymore? There is uh, no instance that I know of where a patient would not be allowed to withdraw from a clinical trial. I, I can't even imagine or think of any circumstance in, in that regard. Uh, so yes, these are completely volunteer activities. You can volunteer to participate, and if you change your mind 10 seconds after you decided to do it, you are, you are allowed and, and you are, uh, um, of course, permitted to uh, uh, what we would call this enroll, that is not participate in that trial. If three months down the road you decide not to withdraw, you can withdraw three months later. Two years later, sometimes these trials go on for five years, ten years, you may withdraw at any point from a clinical trial. That is uh, actually one of the lines in the, in, in the informed consent of every single clinical trial will say, uh, you may withdraw from this trial at any time without any consequences uh, to your medical care. That is, your medical care will not be affected 
whether you decide or you do not decide to participate in that block. Uh, this morning, I had a patient that I had to operate on for a very large ovarian tumor, and she signed up and gave blood to be in a study trying to find a blood marker for ovarian cancer. And lo and behold, uh, fortunately, and Dr. Gutman and I discussed this this morning, um, we um, patient, as it turns out, had a very large tumor, but it looks like it's not going to be cancer, which, of course, is, is wonderful. Um, but, I mean, she will have been entered on the trial for two or three hours, and then she's out of the trial because we don't need a control group for this particular blood marker study that we're doing. So uh, it's a good segue in, into another question I wanted to ask, which was uh, who actually oversees the patient's medical care when they're part of a trial? So Dr. Barter, I'll, I'll address that one. It, it depends on which kind of trial. If it's a blood marker trial, we have a wonderful research unit here at Holy Cross that would monitor that. Um, but those are pretty quick and easy. Uh, I see the patients in the office. I discuss with them that we are trying to find a, a marker for a certain cancer, and then they they give blood, and then they're they're followed up obviously through the through the surgery as the the uh, case I just mentioned. Um, you know, other, other studies that, that we've done is um, an effort to uh, nationalize and make sure that sponges aren't left in patients. Uh, and so some of, them, some of the studies are, are obvious that where the advantages would be. And, and then chemotherapy studies. We uh, follow, we had a, a patient 10 years ago that was on one of, all, one of the studies that we did here uh, with a, at that point, a, a novel, a, a novel biologic drug that would strangle the blood supply from a cancer. And that was, uh, she was on that trial 10 years ago. And so she's still doing great, still being followed. Uh, if she elected, she just said, you know, I'm just tired of this, I'm tired of ha having all this data that's generating and I want to opt out, then that's understandable and that that's fine. That's a really remarkable success story there. Um, so you've touched on this a bit, but uh, clinical trials, uh, can they require additional procedures and tests and, you know, additional assessments that have to be performed upon the patient? And if so, is there any cost to the patient? Who pays for all of this? Yeah, so so yeah, the answer is yes and no. There are trials that will need additional maybe blood draws. Uh, additional collection of data, additional doctor visits, additional laboratory tests sometimes. Uh, and there are t trials that will not need them. So, so the ones that do not need additional uh, elements to them, that the easy answer is there's no additional cost to that. So, but when they do, uh, the, the standard practice is that the sponsor of the trial, maybe it's a pharmaceutical industry, maybe it's a university, maybe it's Holy Cross itself, uh, will uh, take care of any payments related to what we call the trial components. That is, standard of care will still be covered by the insurance company or the patient or Medicare or Medicaid, whatever, whoever it is that's covering that standard of care. Anything beyond that that needs to be done because of the trial will be covered by the sponsor. So it is extremely rare, and, 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 and it's very likely that from an institutional review board, we may not even accept something like that, that the patient would be responsible for covering expenses related to the trial. Uh, you know, I'm sure the exception exists, but here, at, at least our institution, that would not be something that we would likely uh, accept. And, you know, Dr. Barty, you mentioned your, your patient success story from 10 years ago and still having follow-up done. Um, how long do these trials tend to last? And what happens, you know, as they as time goes on um, and the trial either wraps up or there's sort of long-term follow-up for the trials? I, I think for most of, the, most of the studies of that nature where it's a, a chemotherapy uh, study that's involved with, with different chemotherapies, you know, we, we do want to follow the patient a long-term out. Five years is a traditional mark. But I think more importantly, we, again, we don't want these medicines to cause some problem at seven years out or 10 years out. So it's incumbent upon us to make sure that the patients get, get good follow-up.
So we did get a couple of questions from Facebook uh, that I'd like to have you address, uh, both related to uh, partnerships. So I, I think we'll combine it into one question. Um, Dr. Glipman may be, may be best addressed to you, but Dr. Barter, feel free to jump in. Um, can you uh, share a bit about how we handle research partnerships with other organizations or um, we mentioned uh, potentially pharmaceutical sponsors, uh, government agencies, um, even even other systems. Um, how does that come about and how does that impact the research that we do here? So uh, here we really have a, a very diverse uh, combination and mix of trials. Uh, we have uh, NCA, NCI trials, that is National Cancer Institute trials uh, from the NIH. So those are governmental grants or governmental money that sponsors uh, that type of research. Uh, uh, we have uh, pharmaceutical trials. Uh, a lot of pharmaceutical uh, industries are investing very heavily in, in cancer, and they have very novel agents that we would not have access to without participating in those type of uh, industry or pharmaceutical tri type trials. Uh, there are uh, a number of uh, organizations, uh, for example, American Cancer Society, for example, that uh, may uh, have grants to sponsor different types of cancer research. So here we really have a nice mix of uh, government, uh, industry, uh, uh, sponsoring all the type of trials. And, and that really allows us a, a, a significant uh, diversity. For, uh, for many of the patients, as somebody that presents studies to Dr. Gutman and his, his group, uh, to me, it, it, there are a couple of criteria. One, does it look, the initial studies, are they, do they look good? In other words, is there some response and, and, and minimal toxicity, ideally? Um, and, and so I think that's a very important criteria, too. I, I don't, it didn't really, it doesn't really matter. We have patients on industry. We have patients on the GYN oncology group, which is a, a national study group. So it, it doesn't really, it, it really just, how does that research article strike, you know, me or our little subdivision in, in GYN oncology? Thank you. That was a terrific question from Facebook. Um, we're coming down the home stretch here. So, uh, Dr. Goatman, if someone's interested in learning more about clinical trials and research, who can they contact here at Holy Cross? You know, I, I don't memorize our cancer hotline phone. I hope you guys <laughs> uh, put it up in the screen. But yes, uh, we, we have dedicated uh, nurse navigators, that is, uh, nurses that are dedicated to cancer care uh, and that help the patient move throughout the spectrum of their care here, uh, including the research phase of their, of their care. Uh, so uh, if a patient is interested in, in, in research, that is a very good first approach, that is to call our cancer hotline uh, and uh, express interest in, 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 any, in a specific type of research, and, and that, that patient will be directed to the right department that, that deals with that kind of uh, cancer and that kind of research. And Dr. Barter, uh, you know, we've talked obviously about clinical trials and research today, but uh, that is far from the entirety of your spectrum of work. So um, could you just tell us uh, some of the uh, really, really most of the work that you do as a gynecologic oncology surgeon um, outside of your work as our medical director for research? As a GYN oncologist, we basically have we have patients that have an abnormality, something that they're referred in by a general OBGYN, and then we would be able to impact on whatever that abnormality is. Sometimes it leads to surgery. Sometimes it could be uh, medicine. Um, it, it's just it's an array of problems that we can help the patient with. All right. Well. Um I don't think we have any other questions coming in. So uh, with that, we are about out of time. So I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in today. Um, if we didn't get to a question or if you'd like to submit one afterwards, uh, we can always connect with you and provide additional feedback either uh, on phone or with our various web services. You can connect with us to learn more about our available cancer trials and research and our entire cancer services spectrum by calling 1-855-HCH-HOPE. We call that our HOPE line. It's 
1-800-273-4673. Or you can always visit us at holycrosshealth.org slash cancer dash trials. So thank you for joining us today on Facebook Live with Holy Cross Health, and we hope to see you again soon.